And I, I'm really pleased today to have our guest, Maria Gillen. She is very accomplished. Uh, she is a well-known poet. I, I think she's made a million dollars in poetry. And th that's really hard to do. How you do He's it. made what? I couldn't hear you. What did you uh, say? Haven't you made a million dollars on poetry? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> And she's, a million words, maybe, but not a million dollars. She's had more awards than you can fit on an eight and a half by 11 page. And that's listing them in small type. And we are pleased that she is focused on uh, the Italian American experience. And uh, we are of a similar age. So she's got memories that are very similar to, to mine. And uh, I'm, I'm really taken by uh, most of her poems uh, when they refer to the, the people, the sights, the smells, the uh, uh, advertisements of the period uh, that uh, we grew up in and the feelings of maybe a, a little bit of shame of being uh, the children of our parents who didn't speak good English and that sort of thing. Uh, Maria has done a, a couple dozen books and uh, I've been part of uh, many different uh, anthologies. Uh, uh, Garrison Keeler reads her poems whenever he gets a chance. And uh, we uh, on NPR, and uh, we're really uh, pleased uh, to have today Maria Maciota Gillen. Maria? Okay, thanks, Dominic. I appreciate this and appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone. Uh, naturally, when you have a new book, and we haven't been able to get out of the house. So um, it, it becomes very difficult to, to get anywhere with letting people know about your new book and reading poems. So I'm very thrilled to be able to present this book to you this, when the stars were still visible. And it's from uh, Samuel F. Austin University Press um, in Texas. And uh, I'm going to read the first poem. And I will say that when, what I wanted to say in the title, when the stars were still visible in Patterson, New Jersey. But I think it's true of everywhere that's gotten built up and because of uh, global warming and because of pollution, the stars are not visible in the way that they were when I was a child. Even though it was a city, even though uh, houses were crowded together, you still could see the stars and it was a wonderful kind of thing. In the photos, I am on the back steps of the sixth family tenement on Fifth Avenue in Patterson, where I was born. I'm squinting into the sun, my nose wrinkled, my eyes closed against the glare. I am two years old, my hair a curly cap on my head. It looks blonde, though I know it couldn't have been. I wonder if I'm remembering my daughter at two sitting in a little rocker on the front porch on Oak Street in Kansas City. Her hair was all blonde ringlets. Strange how memory is like the fragments of a puzzle. Remember the green blackout shades in our apartment in Patterson in 1944? Where my father dressed as a devil for a costume party at the Soji Chachalantana on Butler Street in Patterson. Remember the silver, silver balls Siwiyamo made from the foil, foil inside the camel cigarettes he smoked that stained his fingers yellow. So many memories swirl like bits of color in a kaleidoscope and so impossible to explain. Remember 17th Street with Mrs. Ginelli always fainted when she got upset and the old man who read the candy store that was so filthy no one ever bought anything there and the big garage in Ginelli's backyard where he put on plays until something happened, I don't know what, something to do with playing doctor behind our improvised curtains and then we weren't allowed to play there anymore. Remember Zili Wes Guillermo's garden with tomatoes and zucchini and corn? and the vacant lot next door that seemed so huge, you'd think we had all of New Jersey to play in. Until I see it years later, covered with asphalt and garages, and I realized that the entire block, my world until I was 11, wasn't that big, 
and said that the lot small and now so ugly. Remember Patterson when the stars were still visible in the sky and I didn't know 17th Street was in a city. Remember the sweet smell of marigolds and daisies in the vacant lot and our house full of food and laughter, our family together under the kitchen light, the company of honorary aunts and uncles. Outside, our friends, friends gathered to play stickball in the street, hours to fill with games and books and dreaming. How lucky I was, how lucky, Patterson glowing and sparkling like a silver ball in my hand. Don't you feel looking back? that there were so many things you, you didn't realize were so wonderful about your background. I, I remember being so embarrassed because my parents' English was not very good. Um, in fact, it was terrible to be honest, but anyway, and, and because my friends would make fun of them and, and I developed this feeling of shame and inferiority and I wanted nothing more than to report my Italian heritage. And now I want nothing more than to take it back because I realize that the most important part of me, the most, the part that's really shaped what I've done with my life and what I've tried to achieve came from that Italian background and from my parents, parents' ideas about how to live, how to welcome other people in, how to open your arms to the world, how to try to give back to the world. My father is very big on trying to do things to change the world, to make it a better place. My mother was very big on cooking for everybody. Um, and so there was always room at her table for one more person, even when we didn't have two cents to our names. Um, anyway, uh, I guess what, what I wanna do is just read a couple of poems and then I'll talk a little bit more about um, what what I what I believe was very very much shaped me in my life. Looking back, I see myself in third grade. Looking back, I see myself in third grade, dreamy child, a child that's afraid of everything, always afraid I'd make a mistake speaking Italian instead of English. My long thin face, my sausage curls, my huge dark eyes. I tried to hide by folding my hands neatly on my desk, by looking down at the names carved on its sur surface by generations of other children. Third grade, we teach me to read poems and stories to us, where I fell in love with the sound of English read aloud, me and my leaky iron hand-me-down dresses, me with my olive-toned skin, listening to Longfellow or John Grief Whittier or Edgar Arlington Robinson read by the teachers in unaccented English, the language so beautiful, their poems carried me away from the dusty time-worn classroom where, to a place where words could sing in my head. At the end of each day, I could go home to a place where I could forget to be afraid. I was happy to go back to my mother's kitchen where I could eat homemade bread fresh out of the oven, home to the aromas of herbs, basil and rosemary and oregano, wafting through the house and greeting me like a kiss each day at the door. Very good. Excellent. Uh, um, do you want me now to talk more or what would you, what would you like me to do? Well, uh, I, I could listen to you read poetry all day long, but uh, tell us about your, um, uh, your feelings about it where poetry and literature fit into the lives of, in, into your life and then into the lives of, of all of us. I think that they, I really think poetry can save your life. I, I believe that completely. I don't think poetry that's been for six men from Harvard is gonna do that. But I think if you're willing to take a chance and write in clear, specific language and speak directly to people that they open up their hearts, it makes cry, it makes them laugh, it makes them think about their own lives, it builds a bridge between you and other people. When I created the Poetry Center now 45, 41 years ago in Patterson, people told me no one would come. Who's going to come to Patterson, which is a kind of decaying uh, old city? Who's going to come there for poetry? And it's been going on 41 years, 
our programs are always crowded. Uh, we have people from all over coming to the program. We just had our 40th anniversary celebration right before we were completely shut down because of the pandemic. And we had people from several states come. We had more than 300 people, but don't tell the fire inspector because we're really not supposed to have that many people. But uh, people came from all over to celebrate the Poetry Center. What I want to do is celebrate the way poetry for me opened a door I didn't even know existed. And that language, when it's beautiful, when it talks about feelings and emotions and love and grief and sorrow can make us think about our own lives and make us reflect back on our own lives and what we value and what's important to us. Um, I think that that's what I was trying to do with the Poetry Center is to bring poetry to people. And it has brought poetry to people. It's so wonderful to see people so excited by poetry. And I, I think that too often when it's left in the hand, I'm an academic myself, so I shouldn't say this, but when it's left in the hands of academics, they try to make it so, they've got to have a reason why they exist. So they have to make it so complicated, they need 45 other people to explain what it means. I was trying to do that kind of poetry when I first wrote, because I thought that was what I was supposed to do, uh, because I was studying literature, and that's the way literature was presented. But gradually, I realized that isn't what I wanted to do at all. But what I wanted to do is reach the janitor and the off audience. I wanted to reach the cleaning lady. I wanted to reach uh, the highest level professor and the lowest level person in the university and in the community. I didn't care. I wanted it to be about being alive and being human. And because I think poetry can make us better human beings. And we really need to be better human beings than we have been in the last year. We can't be fighting with one another like this. It's, my father would be so horrified. Uh, I only hope he's not rolling around his grave because he's in one of those mausoleums and the door is very big. Uh, and I would think he'd be very uncomfortable rolling, rolling around. And he realized, really believed in the problems of America. He believed in FDR and JFK and all the ideas that they had about politics and about living in a country that gave everybody room to move, away, move ahead and be the best person they could be. For him, he loved Italy. Uh, my mother loved Italy. Uh, their towns are beautiful. They're on the top of a mountain. They might be poor, but damn, they are just beautiful. And you can look down off that mountain and look at the sea and the air is so clean and fresh and wonderful. And the people are so alive and so welcoming that I understand how hard it must have been for them to leave that behind. But they came here with the idea to America with the idea that they could get better lives for their children. And if they came here and they sacrificed and they did sacrifice a great deal so that we could have much better, easier lives than they had had. Um, anyway. Dominic, I'm going to ask you another question. I'm running out of okay. steam. I'm going to try some uh, names on you uh, of other writers and uh, ask for your opinion. Or you oh, I, don't, I don't want to. What do you mean, opinion? Negative opinion? No, no, no negative. Well, uh, uh, where did you read Pietro di Donato as? Uh, one? Oh, wonderful. Not as a young girl. When I was older, people didn't, did they present any Italian writers to you besides no. Dante in school? No. Pietro Di Giovanni, I learned, I found him because of Fred Gardefi and Anthony Tamburi. Mm -hmm. And that's why I read, read him and he was wonderful. But he yeah. was not mentioned. I mean, I have, a, I have degrees in English, but they never mentioned Pietro Di Donato. They never mentioned um, anybody else who, was part of, who was Italian. They mentioned, um, wait, he just died. Oh, yeah. This is terrible. I've gone blank on names. Me too, so don't ask me. Uh, well, let's move on to uh, uh, my favorite, uh, one of my, my favorite male Italian American poet, Joseph Tuciani. Yes, yeah, he's lovely work, lovely work. And uh, he, he has, kept on going, he kept on going even when nobody was paying attention to him. That's the thing about Italians, I don't think they give up. 
And mm -hmm. there's a whole other generation also of Italian American writers who are coming along and who are presenting their work and giving us other uh, views of Italian American life. Um, some who are considerably younger than I am, um, some who don't really write that much about being Italian American, but have a kind of Italian American sensibility. There's run wonderful writers like Rachel Guido DeVries, Maria Lucella, uh, Maria Fama. Um, you notice I'm mentioning a lot of women. I used to have a fight with, with uh, Bob Viscusi, God rest his soul. Uh, and because he said, oh, it's unfair that these women are getting attention when Helen Barolini uh, published the book, uh, the dream book. And I said, but Bob, uh, Italian American women writers never got any attention before that. And he goes, oh no, that's not true. I said, it is true, stop it. You, now you're worrying that Italian men, American men are not getting attention, please. Uh, so we had a little set to about that, but I love Bob and uh, we would argue and then we would make up after we argued. Um, there are a lot of wonderful writers out there. Uh, T and Tina D. Rosa. Um, from Chicago. From Chicago. Um, you know, I'm forgetting people and this is terrible. I'm going to feel awful when I get off the phone and off this thing. And Very I've forgotten people. But there are a lot of wonderful Italian American writers at this point who've gotten uh, attention, who've gotten some land national attention. It's very hard if you're not in a certain social um, circle to get the kind of attention you need to get big prizes and big awards. It's, it's really very tough. Have any and, of your poems been made into a movie? Uh, no, <laughs> no, none of my poems have been made into a movie. Although a teacher of mine from high school used to come to all my readings in New York. He lived in New York and he'd show up in a hurricane, no matter what, he'd be sitting in the front. I had him when I was 14 and he would, he, he'd show up and he was like 89, much better shape than I am, I have to say. And he'd be sitting there and he said one time, you know, your books are altogether a memoir. And I'm thinking about that. And I think they are sort of a memoir. They're a memoir in pieces. Um, and if you put them all together, they really are trying to rebuild a past that I didn't know enough to value when I was a kid. And the more I've gone to Italy, the more I've seen where my parents' uh, beliefs and values came from. The more I go to Italy, the more I treasure going there. I hope I'm going to get to go back. Where did uh, they come from in Italy? I, I, they came from Provincia di Salerno, Cilento. My mother came from San Mauro, uh, Cilento, and my father from Galdo. They're two little towns on the top of a mountain, basically. And they were then, quite related. And, um, but it, to me, it's incredibly beautiful. And I love the people. I love the way they open their arms to you. It, it just seems so wonderful. I've, in the last 15 years, I've met first cousins I never met before because you realize that when you come here my parents came here and they left everybody behind and they never were able to go back until after my brother graduated from medical school and then they went back but by then their parents were dead um, and many of their sisters and brothers were already dead and so they went back but it was not quite the same thing as uh, when they left my mother was 23 when she left and she never saw her mother again. So that's kind of a very hard thing. And I can't imagine that. I, if I couldn't see my children again, I just don't know what I'd do. And, but they, they lived through it. And they, we knew them as blue airmail letters. They would send these blue airmail letters and that would be the way that we knew the grandparents. And they didn't even have cameras. So you'd get one little picture and that was your image of what your grandparents were like. Um, uh, so it was, uh, it, they had to build a whole new life here and they were never 100% at home. Although my father loved American politics and loved reading about it, loved discussing it, was really a radical. Uh, I love the fact that he was always willing to take a risk and to go out and try to help other people. 
And I think that's really been a big part of my life. I've tried to do a lot for other poets and other writers and to make a space for them at the Poetry Center. And also when I became a professor at Binghamton University, I tried to make a space for writers to go there, to read, to lead workshops, to open the doors, not just to the two famous writers, but to other writers who were perhaps on the margins a little bit. I tried to make it more diverse. I tried to open it up. And that's what I've spent my life trying to do, create a space for writers and readers who aren't necessarily, don't necessarily have PhDs, but who are still quite capable of understanding poetry. I always think of uh, the readings I've had at the college, at Per Se County Community College, and the audience, sometimes the janitors would come in and they would sit down and they would listen. And you could see that they were really involved in the reading. And I love seeing them there. It, it made me feel so good to see them there and know that they were getting something from this, that they were enjoying it. That it was opening them to a whole thing that they hadn't thought they would, could enjoy. That's why it's important to have clear poetry. I don't really believe that poetry it has to be something that you need 10 scholars to dissect before you can understand it. I hate that kind of poetry. I don't want to do, deal with that kind of poetry. And while I was shortly, a short lived while in love with that kind of poetry, I realized that it was very exclusive, exclusive and elitist, and it was intended to keep people out. And I remember once from the Academy of American Poets, a man who was the president of the Academy of American Poets probably 25 years ago wrote in the New York Times, poetry has always only been a very elitist art form, elite art form. It's for just a few people can understand it. And I thought, you shouldn't be heading the Academy of American Poets in that case, because you're saying something that's wrong to say it's only for a few people, only a few people can understand it. What I've found in my life is that People write to me from all over about my poetry. When my father died, people thought they knew him from my poems. They would write to me. I mean, I get letters from the top of a mountain in Montana, where I've never been, uh, and, and about my poetry or about him, as though they actually knew him. It was uh, quite wonderful. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know about the Poetry Foundation in Chicago, don't they have yes, money yeah. coming out of their ears? I'm the sorry. Poetry I'm Foundation in Chicago, isn't yes. it very well endowed? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Isn't the, it what? The Poetry Foundation in yeah. Chicago. What do you know about their activities? I know a lot because I'm in connected to all these things. Um, I, I think that some of the poetry they push is incomprehensible, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, and that it's changed a lot from its, when it was founded, and that it's become a little more exclusive to the academy and a little more exclusive to, I, I don't want to hurt their feelings if we're in Chicago. <laughs> I don't want to be shot, but, uh, uh, you know, I think it's important to open up and to have more things that can re be read by people and understood by people. Why not? Why does it have to be an exclusive thing for these five white guys from Harvard? No, it doesn't have to be. So I really think it's important for organizations that have big amounts of money, and they do have big amounts of money, to be publishing and um, making room for voices that are clearer and more direct. They don't have to do it all, but they do have to do some of it. And if they push too much of the kind of work that shuts people out, then I don't think they're fulfilling their, their mission at all. Okay, is rap poetry? Anything's poetry as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, you know, so, some rap is quite disturbing, um, and but I think that if it's a, if it, if it gives you something, if it's giving somebody a chance to express emotions and feelings, then fine. Um, 
It's not exactly my idea of poetry, but I would not keep it out. <clears throat> I think we've done a little bit too much of being gatekeepers and keeping people out. And I want to invite everybody in. So if rap is what makes you interested in language, then by all means, you rap. I just don't think that it should be so misogynistic. <coughs> yes, indeed. Spring, spring is here and Maria can't breathe. <coughs> oh, okay, well, uh, uh, how were you impacted by the beat poets and the Italian element? Oh, I, would, I was very impacted by them because I was friendly with Allen Ginsberg and while I didn't agree with some of his ideas, I think his poetry really changed American literature. And what he did was basically open the door for uh, women poets, for black poets, for Italian American poets, for Asian American poets. I think he made room for people, which is what, what I've tried to do and what he did very successfully. I think that he was in correspondence with William Carlos Williams, who also wrote about Patterson and was much more at least himself. But he told Ginsburg, Ginsburg was going to school in, um, at Columbia, and he said to him, why are you writing these sonnets about waterfowl? What, what do you know about waterfowl? Why don't you write about what you know? Why don't you write about Patterson? Why don't you write about being gay? Why don't you write about the kinds of things you write to me in letters are better than the kind of poems you're producing. And Ginsburg went home and he wrote Howell. He wrote uh, Kaddish. He wrote Supermarket in California. He wrote uh, America. Those were wonderful poems because they basically followed the, the Whitman tradition of the long line, the explosive kind of language. And um, it, it made room for people. He and, and uh, Robert Lowell, but I think actually that Gisbert was more accessible to people. And so he had a bigger impact, it seems to me, um, but I could be wrong. He, he seems to me to have been a very big impact on American poetry. And until Howell and Kaddish and all those other poems were published, I, I don't know that that was the kind of poetry that was being written or being taught in schools, but rather after he did that, it made room for Ann Sexton and Sylvia Plath and um, so many other pe people who followed, Nikki Giovanni, all these other people who wrote after, Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, all these people who were not part of um, white America, basically, where it opened up doors for them. And I think we really needed to open those doors. And I, I really loved him. He was a irreverent, uh, risk-taking, um, funny, sardonic man. And he was very supportive of the Poetry Center. And he came and read at lot, a lot of our programs. And in fact, he died uh, about a month before we were doing one of the programs he had been at many times was the Patterson Poetry Mar Marathon that I ran. And he was supposed to read at that, but then he died. But a few years before that, I did a conference and uh, at, at in Patterson and called Patterson, the Poetry of Urban Experience. Patterson, the Poetry of Urban Experience. And it was William Carlos Williams. And then it was uh, Ginsburg, um, Jimmy Santiago Baca, Sonia Sanchez, uh, now I'm forgetting who the other people were, but it was very, we started out reading Miguel Algarin from the uh, New York, uh, New York Poets Cafe, started the reading at the Great Falls, and he was reading from William Carlos Williams, whom he who taught. And so we started at the Great Falls, and we had a saxophone player, and Miguel, who was a ham, uh, reading William Carlos Williams' poems. And suddenly, he looks behind him, and there's a big rainbow. And he said, over the falls, and he said, oh, William Carlos Williams is here, and he blesses this reading. It was so wonderful. And there were so many people, we had to turn people away. So that's the kind of poetry I like. That's the kind of poetry I like, poetry reading I like, where you have so many people wanting to get in that they have to be turned away. Uh, so that's, it's not a rock concert, but it's just as much fun for me. Oh, that's great. That's great. 
Well, we'll throw it open now to um, the questions and comments. And um, I'll, we'll start with uh, Carla, uh, who uh, is uh, at Loyola, Professor of Italian American Studies. Uh, Carla Simonini. Carla? I, oh, I, this is such a wonderful to see you, Maria, if, even if it's only virtually. So um, I, I just, I can comment on a couple of things, you know, coming from the academic background, I used to shy away from teaching poetry because I didn't feel like I had enough background with the meter and the this and that. And once, um, you know, I started uh, learning, going to the, the, hearing the poems read loud. And then I talked to a wonderful colleague of mine, I think, you know, also Michelle Fazio, and she said, you include the work on the level that it speaks to you and you relate it to your students there. And uh, you know, your, your poetry is so beautiful. And um, I think going to live readings uh, makes a big difference. I, I was very, very happy our, you know, for, uh, I'm the editor of Italian Americana, you were our featured poet in 2018. You wrote a beautiful essay about how I learned, uh, you know, what it meant to be Italian. And in that there was also one poem about San Mauro, where your family was from, right, and right, right, another right. one about what I learned from my father. So, uh, and then we did a joint reading with uh, the other Italian American magazine that does literature. And Calandra. Was, at the Calandra Institute. And I remember just listening and at times just being in, you know, having tears come to my eyes, just uh, when you win that, the emotion comes through the words, um, you know, it's very moving. Poetry has, has, has a, uh, like a transcendent effect, I think at times. So I, I just want to thank you for, for all you do and all you give. And uh, um, I, maybe one quick question that I, I know Helen Berolini in the beginning of the dream book, she writes about, um, barriers to women in particular, to Italian Americans and to Italian American women in particular and getting published. And she, it's a very, you know, deep essay. But one of them is exactly what poetry does in terms of revealing the self and reaching out and there being a sort of taboo within Italian American culture of not revealing too much of yourself. I'm wondering if that was- um, Yeah, yeah, or you keep it, you know, <laughs> you wanna maintain la bella figura, you don't wanna talk about right. the hurt, the pain, what's behind it. So is that something that you dealt with? Was, was there any problem with maybe writing something and not wanting your parents to read it? Or I, I'm just curious. If well, my mother was horrified when my first book came out, which okay. was the most, <laughs> I, my little tepid toes in the water of actually telling the truth. And I yeah. mean, I was very delicate about that. And it was de wasn't delicate enough for her. And she said to me, why can't you write the kind of poems that are on the backs of mass cards? I said, of course, I don't want to write that kind of poem. And she said, well, when I was in Italy and we memorized poems, they were all about flowers. And um, now I've written poems about flowers, but not that many. And not the kind of poems she meant. But then I think after a while, uh, I was on NPR, um, on um, All Things Considered, and on another poem called the uh, another program called The Poet and the Poem that another Italian American poet runs, Grace Cavalieri. Oh, yes, and yes, yes. My We've mother heard. heard me. Yeah. She said, oh, now I understand what you're doing. Mm. And she was very private, my mother. She did, my father was very outgoing, wanted to be around people all the time. My mother was very private mm -hmm. and she didn't want anybody. She said, why can't you make up a life of leisure and wealth for us. And I thought, because I don't know anything about a life of leisure and wealth, so I can't make it up. Um, and and uh, so it was a little difficult in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I, I've gotten braver as I've gotten older. Yeah. I think you get to a certain point where you don't give a damn what anybody thinks. <laughs> Just say whatever you want to say, you do whatever you want to do. And I have more and more gotten brave in that way. Now, I was a really chicken person. I was very cowardly and shy. Hard to and, imagine and that, yeah. <laughs> I know it's hard to imagine now, but it's the depth of the truth. Yeah. And wh what happened is I think I started to realize that there was, realize it was kind of a liberation mm -hmm. in telling the truth and really being clear on what you were trying to say in a mm -hmm. poem and in an essay or in writing, mm -hmm. that there was a way of reaching out to other people when you did that. And that if you could make them cry or laugh, mm -hmm. you had succeeded. Yeah. Sometimes you made yourself cry. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I but, can share, uh, you know, personal story. Your um, uh, 
oh, the love story to my husband of 31 years. Yeah. Um, you know, I lost my own husband a, a couple of years ago and I remember, uh, you know, going back and hearing that poem read, um, you know, and I cried, but it, but it was a good cry. You know, it was a cathartic cry. It was a way of, uh, you know, you, you touch my heart. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's what we want to do. Isn't that what we want to do? What's the point of writing if it's mm -hmm. just a philosophical essay? Yeah. You might as well write a physical, physical, philosophical essay if that's what you want to do. But if you want to reach people where they live, you have to be willing to go to a very deep place inside yourself. Mm -hmm. I wrote a book called Writing Poetry to Save Your Life. And it's a partially it's a writing manual, but partially it's a, a memoir about how I came to write and how I came to love language and what it did for me. And mm -hmm. then it has all these prompts so that people can write their own poems. Uh, mm -hmm. So I found it, it was very cathartic to do this book. And I think it's reached a lot of people. I love that people come up to me clutching it and saying it's changed their lives. I, it, I love when somebody says that to me. It, it's a, what, what do you want to do with your work? What do you want to do with your writing? You want to give somebody a new perspective. You want to change the way they look at something. Mm -hmm. You want them to look inside themselves and see the beautiful person that's inside. Too often we're trained to be our own worst enemy, to be our mm -hmm. own big critic. And I think as writers, one of the things we can do is reach out to other people and encourage them and make them feel that they can do whatever they set out to do, mm -hmm. that they, they can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my students put on her screen, on her computer, Maria says you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's beautiful. <laughs> say they could do it. That's really beautiful. Well, thank you for everything that you do. And I'm hoping we have our joint poetry reading. Maybe we can revise it in the fall now that COVID seems, you know, cross our fingers to be under. Oh, that would be so wonderful. Love to do that again. That I'll let so everybody wonderful. in the street know if, uh, you know, it's at the Calandra Institute, but it's uh, poets that, uh, all Italian American poets that have, uh, you know, been published in different venues and are award winning and they read their poems out loud. Um, and we had standing room only the last time we did it. Like we you did, said, it was hot as hell in there, wasn't it? <laughs> it was hot, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so much. I look forward to reading the next one. I know my favorite one so far has always been the Italian women in black dresses is my, you know, <laughs> I know that's a lot of people like that, but I hope you'll look at one. one I will. I will. So. We're still visible. Yeah. And I have so many books at this point that it's so hard to make a choice. Well, thank well, you very much. I'll let someone else ask a question. Okay, let's go across the ocean to uh, Rome and uh, uh, Elizabeth Marino, Eliz Elisabetta Marino. Elizabeth? Yes, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> okay, uh, you translated this lady. What questions do you have? Oh, well, I've got 50 million questions for Maria, but uh, um, instead of asking a question, I would like to share uh, the reaction of my students to Maria's poems. And uh, this is something that I do every year. I teach uh, some of the lessons of American literature on Maria's poems, and they're always fascinated and empowered. And uh, the other day I bumped into a former student of mine who is now a teacher. And she told me that she taught Maria's poems to her students who are between 10 and 12 years of age. And they were moved to tears so they related to the poems. So, so I just wanted to share this because I think this is an excellent result. And this is exactly what Maria wanted to achieve. So really, thank you. You're really influencing generations and generations. You're empowering so. all of us. So thank you so much. I have to tell one story about one of Elizabeth's students. I was going to, in, I was in Rome airport and I was going to Calabria to teach a workshop, an intensive workshop for two weeks uh, from the University of Calabria, but it was held in different parts of Calabria. And I'm in the airport and a woman, a young woman runs up to me and she goes, Maria Gillen, Maria Gillen, right? I'm thinking, who is this woman? 
and she said, I'm, uh, she said, I love your poems and I'm Elizabeth Marino's student. And, and she went on and on. It was so wonderful. <laughs> it was such a, it was such a, an exciting moment to be recognized by this kid. I don't know how she recognized my face, but anyway, <laughs> she did. And it was an, a lovely kind of thing. Welcome to Rome. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. A question arises in my mind about the different place of poetry in Italian uh, education uh, than in uh, uh, American education of, of young people. The, the different place in, in Italian uh, or in... Yeah, the comparison between the two. Oh, I know oh. the Italians do a lot of poetry memorization. Mm. And I don't know that American uh, teachers teach that, or maybe they used to teach it when I was a kid or whatever. Well, they used to teach it when, when I was a kid too. They don't do it so much anymore. Although I find, I tell my students that I have poems that I've memorized. And the wonderful thing about that is you can carry them with you. And that way you're upset or worried or grieving, you can pull out one of those poems that you've memorized and you can say it to yourself as a big comfort. But I think probably more of that is done in Italy than is done in the United States at this point. That could change too. Uh, but right now, I don't think there's not that much memorization. We had a lot of it when I was a kid. Um, and it, it was wonderful for me because I didn't speak English when I went to school. So memorizing those poems in English was very useful for me because it gave me a sense of how beautiful English could be. I always thought Italian was really beautiful, very musical, very, it, it was home in my ears. But then I heard English and I thought English is beautiful too. And it made me really want to write poetry. It made me want to recreate those sounds in, in my own poems. I've always thought <laughs> that uh, in Italian, things sound more dignified, more important, uh, grander uh, than they do in English. Well, I think what happens is, I, I, one of my first translators was uh, Matt Skamaka and Nita Skamaka from Sicily. And I won this award called the American Literary Translators Award. And they translated a book of poems of mine, Luce Gin Verno, a long time ago, 1988. And uh, they invited me there to read my poems. And I went on a 10 day reading tour of Sicily. And it was just wonderful. But they, Nat was a very handsome man, about six feet tall, maybe taller and very good looking man. And he always wore a white suit and he declaimed your po his poems, spread his arms out and uh, shouted. And uh, that's not an American style of, of um, reciting poetry. Uh, but he came to the poetry center. I invited him after I came back from there. And he was so wonderful. You know, he was such a ham. He was, and it's very unusual in America to see somebody waving his arms and being very dramatic in reading, but he did it and he made it work. Uh, so who's to say uh, what's better or what isn't? It's what you're used to too. Uh, for some people that would be too much. But for me, I liked Nat so much, so much that I really loved it when he did that. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's call next on uh, Tony Artizone out uh, on the West Coast uh, in Oregon. Tony, uh, what uh, comment or question do you have for Maria? Well, Maria, it's wonderful to see you again. It's wonderful um, to see you. What are you doing in Oregon? Oh, I live in Portland. I've been here the last eight years. Uh, I was, was able to leave. Since we were yes, I was able. Yeah, well, we saw. I think I saw you in Rome. Um, what was that three or four years ago? Three or four, three I didn't know you were in Oregon. I don't know yeah. why. You I, what I wanted to do, uh, congratulations on the book. I love the reading. But let me also thank you and bring up the uh, topic of your, um, the mini anthologies that you've edited. Um, I'm very, one of my great prides is that you edited, you published one of my stories 
in one of your books, I believe it's Identity Lessons, a delightful book that I've used in the classroom. And I was just so pleased to be in such, such charming company and such rich company. You're one of the first, I think, um, one of the first editors who really grasped multiculturalism in a way that I think um, uh, speaks to students and speaks to everyone and, and certainly to writers. Um, I hope so, because that was a very important part of what Jennifer and I were trying to do, my daughter Jennifer and I were trying to do in putting those anthologies together because she had started teaching um, in Boston, in the Boston area. And mm -hmm. she had come, I dragged her to every poetry reading. And she said, how come all the people you had read at the college are not in any of the anthologies? So we started exchanging poems and she would find poems and I'd find poems. And I'd said, she said, we should do an anthology. So we did on Stanley America first. Mm -hmm. That was in 1984. And then in 1988, we did uh, Identity Lessons and Growing Up uh, Ethnic in America. And I really think that people who had not been in any of those anthologies, the major anthologies got picked up from our books. I don't yeah. want to be conceited, but I swear, all of a sudden, people know who these people are they didn't know before. Because they would pick the same two Black people, the same two Hispanic people, uh, maybe one Asian person, it, and but then they started to widen their reach. And I loved it when they did that. I said, oh, Jennifer, they stole another one of our poets. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> because I wanted more people to know what wonderful work was out there. And there was a, a lot of really wonderful work out there. It's another example of you being a, a breaking ground and other people then following your example. Um, it was wonderful. I have to say, I was so thrilled by that yeah. because uh, it, it seemed to me that it was a very close little club. Like the Norton Anthology had a very small number of people that they printed who were not white. Uh, and so I loved that they seemed to pick up this and then say, oh, we should do this, we should do that. Um, and, and it made me very happy, I have to say. You were also brave enough to put Italian Americans in the company of other ethnic writers. Um, I thought well, that we didn't get criticized for doing that, but too bad. I know. I at Indiana, I started a class in ethnic American literature, and in the uh, in the description included Italian Americans, but I was the only teacher who, who when I taught that who taught that class who included Italian Americans. Aren't they ethnic? Do they like us? No. Do they come to always tell us we're mafioso? Yes. I, I think I think Christopher Columbus has something to do with it, but <laughs> let's not get into that. Let's, oh, yeah. not, let's not go there. It's been going on for years, way before Columbus. Yeah. Way before the Columbus yeah. thing. It's just a question of we're not the right ethnic group. We were in, and unfortunately, some of our compadres have become so conservative that you want to hit them on the head when they open their big mouths and you say, shut up, you're an embarrassment to us. Please, my parents couldn't speak English and they wouldn't say such dumb things. <laughs> but on behalf of fiction writers, let me thank you for what you've done for fiction writers in your anthologies and also what you've done for writers um, through, the, through the Poetry Center, et cetera. I might think one of, the, one of the most delightful awards you received is the Garrett, the George Garrett Award. I don't think that was a, better than that. Yeah. That was a big, it was a big deal. Although I love getting the American Book Award, I have to say. <laughs> I love getting that. And I love getting the Poets and Writers, uh, Writers for Writers Award. It was really fun. And it, it was, you know, you work really hard for many years and you don't have time to stop and think, is anybody noticing? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you get a bunch of awards. And you start thinking maybe somebody else is noticing, and I'm not just piling away in this field by myself. Well, I'll let you get on to other questions, but again, it's such a delight to to see you and hear you. Maria Rosario, the story to uh, PLR, the Patterson Literary Review. Hello, Maria. 
compliments for your poetry and your readings. Not many poets are able to read what they write as you do so well. Um, you know, I was thinking of poetry as the meaning of meaning, but you abolished that. Poetry is not form. It's more about emotions, the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Um, I started writing poetry myself some years ago, and it made me feel so good, especially when I had bad times and even suffered from nostalgia of America, because I'm Italian American or American Italian. But my question for you is about the, the value of poetry uh, for children ages three to 14. Um, I'm a um, school principal here in Rome. And, um, you know, and then I stop by the kindergarten and they come up with these little poems that they memorize and they perform and recite for me. Oh, Mrs. Principal Bella Deliziosa. They're really nice. And then I think about, you know, the older students um, at ages about 10, 13 with behavioral problems. So about the value of poetry. Do you think that poetry could help? I mean, since you wrote something so nice, like writing poetry to save your life, how could we save the life and change the life of these children, students with problems ages 10 to 13? Team. Usually behavioral problems. Um, oftentimes we are obliged to suspend them just so that they can come, you know, can improve their behavior and their citizenship values. So how could you help us here, Maria? Well, uh, one of the things I did at the Poetry Center was to start the theater and poetry project, sending poets into the schools to work into the public schools and the public schools in Patterson are very much inner city schools. Um, the children have a lot of problems, a lot of social problems, a lot of uh, money problems, uh, problems with parents who not, don't pay attention or don't know how to help them. And so I decided that one of the things I was going to do was to set up a program that would bring writers into the schools to work with the students to write their own poems. And it's been, it's like 35 years old, the program. It's been immensely helpful to these students. I think if you could get some poets in who understand children, who can have them write and who can have them write about what they're feeling, if they can write it down, it gets some of the poison out of their uh, systems and they can stop misbehaving. I swear it works. Uh, it gives them an opportunity to feel good about themselves. We have a poetry contest for them. We publish an anthology of their work. We have a reading where they come and read their poems. Um, and I think in a way that saves their life. If they can learn how to write their pain and write it down and express it in a poem, then they can do anything. It's a healing thing. It's healing for me. I don't know if it's healing for you when you write, but when I write about something that has been very much left me grief stricken, uh, my mother, husband's dying, my parents' death, um, the death of a very old friend, uh, all those things, if you can write about them, it's very healing to the spirit. And I think it's healing to other people who read it. Uh, so I, I would suggest you try to find some poets who are willing to go into the schools and talk to the students, not talk to, down to them and not suggest that they have to write in rhyme or a certain meter or anything like that, but rather encouraging them to, to write about their street or their parents or somebody they love or um, their grandmother's cooking or their grandmother's kitchen, something very rooted in the everyday. It helps them to put down things that make them feel better and, and that are maybe troubling them. Uh, I think you'd find that, that if I come to Rome, but it, I can't really, my Italian is a dialect, so that's not too good, but I'd, be, I'd love to come into one of the classes if somebody could translate for me. And uh, I'd love to come into one of the classes and talk to the students about writing 
and try to get them to write about their lives. I've done it all over the United States. I've never tried to do it in Italian, <laughs> but I have done it in English all over the United States. So um, it's something that I think would help them a great deal. And since you love poetry, you can introduce poetry to them. I found that introducing Langston Hughes, for example, which is often very simple, very simple language that he uses, but then you can get them to write a poem modeled on something that he did. Um, I wrote a very simple poem about my fifth grade teacher. And um, uh, one of the people who goes into school to use that program with uh, the kids who were in fourth grade. And uh, one of the kids wrote her a note and she said, that woman should keep writing. <laughs> that woman should keep writing. And he wrote a wonderful poem in response to my poem. So I think that's the kind of thing you can get. It, it, just because somebody's acting out doesn't mean they're not in pain. And very often acting out is a function of being in pain and a result of being in pain. So if you can get that to put it in language and write it down, it's a way of drawing out some of the poison in their lives. <clears throat> and some children are really suffering. I see it in Patterson. Uh, I remember having a, a child tell me that her stepfather told her she was ugly and stupid and uh, wasn't worthy of anything and was never going to make, it, make anything of herself. And she wrote a poem about that. And I said, listen, you can make anything out of yourself you want and don't listen to him. He's got something wrong with him. So you need to say to yourself, when he says that to you, say, you're the one that's stupid and ugly. I'm not stupid and ugly. I'm going to do whatever I make up my mind to do, which is certainly what I did in my life. So I, I, I try to encourage them to think in those terms. They can do anything they make up their minds to do. Thank you so much, Maria. And you're very welcome. You are the best poet to teach us all these things. Very welcome to Rome whenever you're here. Another question. Uh, anyone out there? Uh, let's see. Uh, CJ, you know the lady. <laughs> I know Hi, CJ. Hi, Maria. Hi, How sweetie. are you? Good. How I've are you, Doc? I'm good. I, I just tuned in to hear you read and hear what you had to say. I don't I don't really have any questions right now, but but it's great to see you. It's good to see you too, CJ. Hopefully we'll have a we'll have a program at the at the retreat house soon. That would be wonderful. I really miss them. And I miss you. So I miss you too, CJ. Okay, anybody else? Uh, Carla, you want to come back in or? Well, no, just to say, I mean, thank you so much. I mean, I love hearing you your, do your reading. I'm going to put your your newest anthology of poetry on, on my uh, Amazon purchase list. My cart keeps filling up there. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I keep giving away books and more keep growing up. Oh, so. All right, how about if I read a poem? Yes, yeah. that would be lovely. People are out of, out of things to, okay, I'm going to read a poem called Meatloaf and Hamburger Helper. Now, the Italian is not going to know what that is. Believe me, you don't want to know. <clears throat> Growing up, my mother cooked macaroni and gravy, meatballs and brajola, spinach, lentil soup, roasted chicken and potatoes, made zeppoli, big salads fresh from the garden, zucchini with rosemary, meals so delicious. <clears throat> I could still taste them. When my children were growing up, my mother-in-law taught me to make American food that my husband liked because he grew up on it. So I learned how to make pot roasts and lake of lamb and stew and roast beef, pork chops and steak and baked potatoes. She taught me how to make meatloaf, which is cheap and could be used for one meal plus sandwiches. She taught me to make meals with hamburger helper, which my mother called that junk. Years later, my stomach turns at the thought of hamburger helper, the greasy feel of it, the fake chemical taste of sauce and spices, <clears throat> flavor created in a lab. When I served those meals in different, so different from anything my mother ever cooked, I felt I had arrived in middle-class America, that I now belonged in a land almost guaranteed 
you die a heart attack <clears throat> before you could reach old age. Not the land of my father, too poor to buy all that meat, even if he had wanted it. My father, who died at 92, sitting in, his, in the sun in his garden, the aroma of tomatoes and peppers and zucchini perfuming the air around us, around him. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and what I love uh, about that is that I was so sure that Amer to be American, to be able to pull on America as though uh, the putting on a face mask was what I wanted to do. And as I've grown older and older and older, um, I've come to realize that that's not really what I wanted, that my vision of America was not really what I wanted, that I wanted in some way to transform myself, as so many of us do, into something that's more accessible to other people, more acceptable to other people. Um, and so often I would try to uh, wear clothes that I thought were uh, very American and like everybody else. And the older I've gotten, the more I've said, oh, to hell with that, I'm wearing whatever I want and I'm wearing whatever colors, like colors I want and I'm not going to pay any attention to that. Um, I want to read one more poem, if you don't mind. My son, the lawyer, quotes Dylan Thomas to give me courage. After I lose my balance and fall, smashing my nose against the hardwood floor, I slip in a huge puddle of blood, try standing up, but my feet keep sliding. I've always loved mystery story, but about Pete stabbed to death, but never thought about the blood, how the earth could break his neck, sliding in it. After the hospital, after the x-rays, after the EKGs, the four-hour drive to Binghamton, after I teach my class, looking battle-scarred, I think of my son, who tried to tell me I should cut back and give up poetry, proving he did not understand anything about me. When I talk to him on the phone, he's shocked to hear defeat in my voice. I am always optimistic about everything, even in the middle of calamity, but today I am brought low in, by the recognition of my own frailty. My son, the lawyer, the practical, pragmatic one, says, how many women your age have a job they love doing, a life they love living? Later, he sends me a quote from Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rage at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. I repeat the lines over and over to myself. Great to grateful to his, this son, I was sure, didn't understand anything about me. Excellent. And isn't that the way it is with us? We think someone doesn't understand us, and then uh, we find that maybe they understood us better than we thought. Well, um, very good. Uh, the book, again, the latest book, and uh, uh, is um, what's the name of it uh, under the when the stars were still visible when the stars were still visible, still visible. were and still then... visible and uh, I had the picture on the front is one of my paintings which I love I have to say I'm having such a good time I thank my darling Diane De Prima who passed away last year because she pushed me into um, she pushed me into painting again I had painted when I was a young woman mostly like splashes on canvas. Uh, but then she got me to paint. And I've been having such a wonderful time with it. And I've, I've got a sort of a sense, reinvented myself, as my daughter says, you keep reinventing yourself. And I re reinvented myself as an artist. And I'm selling lots of paintings. <laughs> so oh, it's wow. Really quite wonderful. Uh, I'm happy. Joy is a great thing. And I think the biggest thing my parents told me is how to have joy. And the thing I see in Italy among the Italians is their ability to be happy, their ability to take an ordinary day and make it magical. And I love that. I love that about going to Italy. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. And a nice hand for our guest today, Thank Maria. Thank you. Dillon. Beautiful. Thank you, all of you guys. Thank you. Bye -bye.